<clears throat> it's my pleasure to interview Perry Toman, member of the class of 1929, also a former dean of the University of Nebraska College of Medicine. You have in your lap the Caduceus 1929. Your picture is in there. Thinking back um, 50 years, what do you remember most about your experiences as a medical student here at the College of Medicine? Well, I suppose the bear dope that we were given before we came here had considerable influence because uh, remember our class shuddered with the thought that uh, we understood that by the end of the first year the class was going to be reduced by at least 25 percent and that just seemed to be cut in standard. I think I was a little surprised at the cordial reception most of us at least received with Dr. Latta as our first instructor. And then the other course we took at the time was bacteriology called then. But uh, that reduced the class appreciably. And then of course we went on into the gross anatomy which took up practically all the rest of the year and some of the other studies. Um, personally, I found uh, all of the faculty I dealt with uh, very congenial and easy to approach, although I know there were a lot of my classmates that uh, shuddered if they saw one of them looking at him. <laughs> because they were sure they were going to be ushered to the dean's office the next thing. Well, as you look back on your college of medicine days as a student, did you have an opportunity to reflect on this when you became dean yourself? Oh yes, I thought about it uh, every now and then because obviously there are changes going on all of the time. Uh, I think there's probably not a year, but what some courses are different than they were the year before and then it seems to be a pattern that uh, every few years you have to shake up the whole thing. Now, a few courses stay on but uh, they rename some of them and go back to their same notes and teaching, I suspect. But many, many others change a great deal with new information and new philosophies of education. You finished in 29. 29. And then, as I recall, you took a residency in pathology? I was in pathology at the Brigham Hospital in Boston. Boston. And then Dr. Pointer invited me to come back to the faculty here, primarily in clinical pathology, which was beginning to show some importance. Uh, really up to that time, uh, blood counts and urinalysis were about the only laboratory work and the interns did that. Uh, but within the few years that I was in school, uh, there was much more being written about uh, the importance of different kinds of blood counts and and bacteriology and culture work was really blossoming a great deal. So I was asked to come back to uh, head up what amounted to clinical pathology section of the pathology department. So you came on the faculty here, when was that that you came on the College of Medicine? In uh, September of 1931. And you were then here with Latta and Holyoke? Yes. Yeah, I was starting off the junior member of the faculty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we just went on from there. All right. What do you recall as far as the buildings? Now, some of our other interviewees have commented there was essentially the North Building, South Building, University Hospital, and they built a new wing on, I think, while you were in school. While we were in school, yes. Mm -hmm. And the Conkling Hall, I think, and that was about Conkling it. Conkling Hall had been built. Uh, but the hospital consisted of only the, what we call Unit 1, one wing, mm -hmm. was all there was of University Hospital. While we were here, they built what was called Unit 2. And uh, all that disrupted the baseball diamond and the track that used to be behind the so University they Hospital. built that to the west of the Unit 1? Of Unit 1, yes. Oh. As you look back on that time as a member of the faculty here then, in the uh, late 30s actually, what was the political climate of the 
public climate as far as support of the College of Medicine in the 30s and the 40s? Well, of course you remember those were, uh, well, you wouldn't remember. My dad those, kept telling me yeah. that, but you're right, you're right, you're right. <laughs> because uh, the crash of 29 and the drought of the early 30s had reduced the productivity of this state uh, just tremendously, really. And uh, so there was even more concern about taxes than there is at the present time. Uh, I'm not sure that the people were any more vocal than they are now, but uh, at least the, the legislators knew that they were going to have to be awfully cautious about taxes if they wanted to keep their jobs. So, uh, oh well, I can give you a, a small example. In the first year or two that uh, I came here, we started uh, an on-the-job training of medical technologists. They were technicians then, but they've become technologists mm -hmm. since. Uh, there was no tuition. Uh, they worked in the laboratory doing the things that they were being trained to do. And among the first three that finished our course, one stayed on for a year at no salary because there weren't any jobs. Uh, hospitals out over the state generally, for instance, and this is true of adjoining states, didn't have anybody in the laboratory. The doctor wanted a urinalysis, uh, he did it, or taught one of the nurses to do it, and uh, maybe somebody would do a blood count, but that was the magnitude of laboratory work at that time. And uh, so we just kind of went on from there. By the way, the end of the first year I was on the faculty, the legislature cut the salary of all state employees by 25 percent. They cut the salary? They cut the salaries by 25 percent. How did you explain that to your wife? Uh, well, she is a Nebraskan and I think <laughs> understood. Okay, okay. As it happened, I was hurt less than some of the others because I had spent that first year paying back some of my college debts and uh, finished up enough of them that the 25% cut didn't hurt quite that much. <laughs> and in the 40s, how was he seen here when you were a faculty member? Oh, one other little incident that right. might amuse you of that early 30s period. Dr. Pointer, <coughs> Dr. Pointer was dean and of course had to appear before the legislature to justify the enormous expenditures of the medical campus. And one of the uh, legislators said, can't you run that hospital on less money than you're spending now? And he said, yes, I expect we could. We could put straw on the floor. And they apparently accepted that enough so that we got along. And as an example of the, of the rates that we were accustomed to at that time, in the mid-30s, and I don't know the precise date offhand, there was quite a hassle going on as to whether the counties uh, should pay anything toward the uh, cost of hospitalizing patients from those counties. And the legislature finally devised a formula that the county would pay two-thirds of the cost of the hospital day, but not to exceed $4 per day. Not and to exceed. Not to exceed. And actually, our costs were not a lot above that because uh, nurses uh, got uh, 35 to $50 a month. The head nurse probably got more than that. But that was the scale of pay during those real hard times. Hmm. About the size of the class, did that go down during the Depression years? No. Still no. the same? No, the class really remained very much the same until the war years came along when there was a good deal of pressure to enlarge the numbers of graduating students mm -hmm. which we accomplished in part by increasing the number per class and then 
by going to the three-year curriculum, which we used all during the Second World War. But uh, no, the that period of the 30s and 40s was when the numbers of physicians in small communities was declining. So we were being asked repeatedly, can't you turn out more doctors so we can have a doctor in our community? And with the now, those doctors who were um, retiring from the small communities were the ones that uh, were graduated by the fly-by-night schools of the 1900 period, uh, when <clears throat> finally the Flexner Report came out right. and called attention to the bad status of many, many of the schools. But that generation of doctors were dying and the communities were asking for more. So we were not urged to cut back. Hmm. So with World War? World War II, then with the military needing so many hmm. physicians, right. We were urged, can't you increase your classes somewhat? And you went into the three-year accelerated program. We went into the three-year accelerated program. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps it ties in here as well as any. Uh, I'm sometimes asked, were there changes in the qualities or perceptions of the medical students, the kinds of people we dealt with over that span of years? I think the most dramatic change, as far as I'm concerned, related to World War II, when the very great majority of our students were in military service, assigned to the medical school, mostly Army, some Navy. Air Force wasn't mm -hmm. separated at that time. And then there were some students who were going through uh, in the usual fashion. But for the first time in my remembrance, medical students had a regular, consistent income and began to be married while they were in medical school. They were receiving the service stipend? They were, they were receiving a service salary. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this led to some friction between the Navy boys and the Army boys because the Army had to get out and drill every Saturday. Mm. They had to stay in uniform. The Navy boys had uniforms, but they didn't have to wear them, and they didn't have any drill formations and so forth, but uh, that's beside the point. But anyway, this, uh, this gave them an opportunity for marriage that mm -hmm. hadn't applied to very many. For instance, when my class graduated, I don't know, but I would guess there were not more than eight or 10 of the 74 who were married by the time they graduated. Uh, with the war, that was reversed, mm -hmm. almost. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the years following World War II, perhaps 25% of the students were married when they came to medical school. Um, how did your salary do in the 40s? You were, you were what? Not, how did your salary do in the 40s? You were not doing too well in the 30s. Well, as a faculty member, none of us really expected to earn as much as a practicing physician earned. Mm -hmm. um, we did have, however, a uh, little promise of security in a sense that uh, we were, we, we had a pension promised. Uh, if we looked at the details of the proposal, uh, if we stayed on the faculty to the time of retirement and worked up to the top levels of university to pay, we could get as much as $200 a month pension. That plan was set up when I think the chancellor probably got $4,800 a year. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and it wasn't changed for years and years. And finally, of course, that changed over into the TIAA right. contributing Cref formula, and so on. But our salaries were, I think, not bad. They didn't match the practicing right. position, but I think we had a feeling of security enough in our positions that uh, we didn't worry all that much. Now, the 50s brought some major changes for you. That brought major changes, yeah. You had been in pathology. 
and now you became dean. Yes. Why did you choose to become dean, if I may ask? That's a long story. Well, I, I mentioned to you before we started, uh, you were the dean here when I was in the College of Medicine. <laughs> it was one of the first times in my life I could ask the dean questions <laughs> instead of the other way around. I mean, you've been on the faculty. Yes, I've been on the faculty, you see, then for 20 years. Mm -hmm. But um, things were changing. The uh, review of medical schools was becoming more critical. And uh, our school was one that was considered to be not doing average level training by and large, especially in the clinical years. Mm -hmm. Because up to that time, all of the clinical faculty were volunteers, including the chairman. And uh, this led to a degree of uh, uh, individualization within the teaching of any department. It was not really coordinated very well. And uh, uh, complained to the students that some of the men, and especially the busier ones, that they really wanted to hear and be involved in their teaching, would have to get somebody else to take their place this day or this week and so right. on. So it, I think there was some basis for question. And uh, then my predecessor in the office uh, again had the facility for annoying an unusual number of people. So there came to be a lot of friction and tension between the dean and the faculty, and this led to some tensions among faculty, et cetera. And it uh, finally came to the place where uh, he left, and they asked me to uh, take over the job. I think I was in a, an unusual situation, really, within the faculty in that my contacts were with basic science faculty and with the clinical faculty because with the pathologic service and the laboratory service, I was dealing with the clinicians all the time. And I think they felt that I was one that understood all phases of the faculty composition, training, responsibilities, etc. And um, I, I felt I could do it, and so I said yes. Great. How long were you dean? What was the Twelve time? years. Twelve years. I know it's difficult, but what would you point to your three major accomplishments from your point of view? I know it would be difficult because many things went on then. Yes, a number of things happened. One, I think this change led to a healing of some of the tensions within the faculty, we were able to bring in uh, full-time people in the clinical departments in which we brought in Dr. Grissom in internal medicine, Dr. Musselman in surgery, um, Dr. Gibbs in pediatrics, Dr. Gibbs in, in pediatrics and uh, I think Dr. Holly was the fourth. No. There was a, I've been corrected on that. That's why I hesitated. Um, Lester O'Dell. Okay. okay. I am blocking because, uh, well, you don't know radio of that period. There was a famous character on the radio, Digger O'Dell. That's right. And he was very promptly named Digger. I said, now, wait a minute. You're getting into my age group. I came to College of Medicine, you know, in 53. Yeah. So I'm, All right. Well, you, you brought you know the, the first four, four full-time staff. That's right. Yeah, that's a major step forward. Well, as uh, we developed our philosophies, and I must say that Reuben Gustafson, who was chancellor at the time, was really a very great help mm -hmm. in all of this. I think he understood, understood the, the medical component of a university right. better than his predecessors, and if I may say, of his successors. And uh, so that seemed to be the important first step. Agreed, this is going to take more money. We want the legislature, and they were receptive. 
They didn't ever give us as much as we asked for, but then <laughs> I've never known that to happen. Uh, second, it was realized we were going to have to do more building, have more space and more facilities for various activities around the place. And uh, so we got this building program going. And then we got into more research. And one of the things we got was the Epley building, which was the first concrete example of, of coordinated research functioning wow. on this campus. Now, there had been research going on in, in the basic science departments most strongly, but some in the clinical departments before that. I um, there's one, one little comment, almost a side comment in a way I'd like to toss in. You may remember a character with the name of Terry Carpenter, who was uh, in the legislature for years and years and years. Terrible Terry, and he yes. was very proud of the name. Very shortly after I came into the office, Terry called me and wanted to know if he and his wife could come down and visit with me about the medical campus and what we were doing and what our hopes were and so forth. And they came, we spent a whole day. I went over everything, opened up all of our books. We looked at the curriculum and talked about why it was organized as it was. We toured the facilities and the hospital and uh, uh, dropped a few hints of things that we were not able to do in caring for patients that uh, were a part of current medical practice of the time and so on. And I must say that Terry was always helpful for the rest of the 12 years I was in that dean's office. Now, he tore a lot of other people apart, but uh, I must say that Terry, I think, understood what we were trying to do, and I, I found him very helpful. And you got many things done. We got some good starts. Uh, the new Conkling Hall. No, Conkling Hall had been built for that. That had been built. Yeah. Nebraska Psych we got Institute. We got the new nursing school building, uh, the one beside Conkling Hall. Yes. That's we got N the NPI one. was one of the earlier ones. We got the uh, Animal House, which has now been renamed a couple of yes. times. We yes. got the start of University Hospital. We called it Unit 3. It's mm -hmm. been almost covered up since. Combined program with Children's Hospital. Combined, combined program with Children's Hospital. and uh, So I think we got some things done. You should be very proud of your accomplishments as dean. No? Well, I mean that sincerely. You so. should be very, very proud. Yeah. After you left as dean, as I recall, you went to Thailand. To we went to Thailand for a year. They were opening a new medical school there. So I went up and uh, worked with that faculty, which was a real interesting experience. Uh, I must say that I found the Thais, the, the friendly uh, people, they accepted us. The one thing that did bother a little bit is that uh, they're very deliberate. Mm -hmm. I caught on very quickly when I got there that, uh, of course, I was working with the pathology department that the best way was going to be to uh, talk over with them some things that uh, might be changed and present this as several alternatives right. and what I saw the advantages and disadvantages of each and uh, then nothing would happen. And then about three months later here would come a memo from the chairman of the department that this is going to be and, and he, he always picked the one that I had thought I presented the most advantages for, but uh, they had to talk it over and they made the decisions and, and I thought we got along very well. That's excellent. So the last 50 years have been very good years for you, haven't they? They have. They, they have. have. You've done a great deal. A great and that's deal. been a most fantastic 50 years in a great many respects. I know you've been interviewed before. Uh, as far as the centennial, 100 years mm -hmm. of our medical center, and you represent half of that 100 years. Ms. Hetzner, our librarian, has discussed the role. I think you're having been a staff member to understand the value of a library. And yes. Indeed, is yeah. that is a major yeah. backbone of the College of Medicine. Could you comment on that? Yes, I can tell you things about that. Uh, 
And some of this antedates my deanship. Mm -hmm. this, so I'm not taking any credit for that. But in those hard years of the early 30s, this faculty and, and pretty heavily the basic science faculty, uh, with good support from the clinical faculty, but uh, they weren't being paid, so this was not quite the same situation, decided that maintaining the library accessions and function was one of the most important things to do. And they agreed to cutting their departmental allowances for general maintenance of their departments in order that their subscriptions and the various library functions could be kept up. So this has been a tradition going back a long way. And of course, some of those earlier men on the faculty really started, gave this library a big boost. They were bibliophiles. They were Roy Crummer. And, uh, uh, stands now particularly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that, uh, yes, I think the, the library has been a, a particular point of pride to this faculty for a long time. And the book in your hand represents uh, 50 years ago for you? 50 years ago. And 50 years ago. It's 50 years, which I, I personally have appreciated reviewing with you for our archives as far as the centennial year. Thank you very much, Dean. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Good.